There you go. Nice. Thank you, Jonathan. Hi, folks. Welcome back. This is the last panel uh, of the symposium, and uh, I will be moderating it. And the panel is on uh, mythopoiesis and individuation. We have three presenters, uh, Jonathan Kay, Alex Stein, and Paige Barrows. Uh, and uh, I just want to uh, say on a personal note, you know, that I've had the privilege and honor and joy of working with Jonathan uh, for the last few years at the school. Um, so this is it's kind of nice that you're participating on a panel that I'm moderating. Um, and uh, both Alex and Paige have been students of mine, and I've had numerous conversations with both of them. Um, so this is kind of uh, very sweet uh, for me to be doing this. Um, Thank you for inviting me, Jonathan. Okay, so in um, uh, uh, because we're, because time is short, we're not going to read the abstracts today. I'm just going to introduce each of the speakers uh, by their bios. Please refer to the brochure that uh, Jonathan sent out uh, for the symposium so that you can see the abstracts themselves. Okay, so the first uh, participant. Uh, and panelist uh, is Jonathan. Uh, he's a transcultural musician and is currently a PhD student in the Department of East-West Psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco under the mentorship of Dr. Debishish Banerjee. In search of non-Western ways of musical knowing, Jonathan moved to Kolkata, India, uh, and for 10 years traditionally studied North Indian raga music, innovating its expression on the saxophone and learning the rare Indian instrument at the Boro Esraj. He's also traveled to Kyoto, in Japanese Takahashi music. His research is exploring the intersection between Eastern wisdom traditions grounded in the integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo and post-structuralist philosophy and psychology based on the work of Gilles Deleuze and Felix, uh, Felix Guattari. As a practitioner in arts-based research, Jonathan is exploring musical philosophical horizons between thought and sound and his original music is based upon heterocultural and transnomadic experimentation through contemplative models of improvisation. Jonathan uh, also um, uh, records and publishes records. Um, uh, and I think, is this, is the, is your, the website, uh, www.jonathank.ca, will that link uh, people also to the music? Absolutely, yep, videos and audio. Okay, wonderful. Anyway, Jonathan, please take it away. All right. Thanks, Stefan. It's an honor to be here. I'll just get my start sharing and just confirm that you can see the, the full screen. Yes, it looks like it. All right. I'm just going to give us a little, some sonic, uh, something to start. All right. So something uh, that was from the, the musician, uh, William Parker, and we're going to end uh, speaking about him. Um, can't see the chat. If somebody sent me a chat, if you could say it out loud, because I can't actually access chat right now. Alex says, I love this dance party. Oh, okay, got it. Sorry, I, I didn't know if it was a technical thing. Okay, well, I'm just going to jump in here. So this is a little bit of an overview. Um, and I'm going to say, what what is at stakes here in this research? Um, I'm approaching new theoretical um, approaches aiming to overcome the duality or gap between the scholar and the practitioner, uh, and also redefining knowledge production and reintroducing arts-based research back into the academy as a co-creative inquiry based on this new scholar-practitioner posture. So the collision between philosophy or thinking and music or sound. So to start our inquiry, we will, we will begin with a provocative question raised by uh, French thinker, Francois Laurel, taking up Socrates' comments. 
on philosophy and music. Quote, the dream kept urging me on to do what I was doing, to make music, since philosophy, in my view, is the greatest music, and that's just what I was doing. So Laurel asks, is philosophy the greatest music, as according to Socrates, or maybe is music the greatest philosophy? Here's a quote from Francois Laurel's book, Tetralogos. Quote, what is the most beautiful and greatest amongst the arts of the soul, philosophy or music, one relatively to the other? Is music the most beautiful of philosophies? Philosophy being thus compromised as a norm and value for music, or is philosophy the most beautiful of music? Thus, to intensify this question, we are given the conditions to be able to ask ourselves if music thinks, even if probably it does not think like philosophy, but perhaps with the help of philosophy, and in this case, that we take um, what sorry, what we take as a very risky anticipation, it is music that would contribute towards thinking philosophy. Okay, so we have um, a diagram here I'll, I'll get to in a second. According to Laurel, since the time of Socrates, philosophy has granted itself the authority to think about music, therefore over-determining music through its discourse. Philosophy, and therefore musicology, has instated itself as first, quote, or superior discourse based on what he calls the principle of philosophical sufficiency. This means that through an internal auto-positioning function called the philosophical decision, philosophy always has a meta-positionality, which gives it the hallucination that it can actually think about music and thinks on behalf of music. And that's number one in this uh, diagram, view from above. Laurel's non-standard philosophy aims to overcome the problem of thinking about the real, or music in this case, and rather asks us to think from the real, or music. This can be understood through musical experience in which music is spontaneously generated from a lived experience without the need of thetic self-reflexivity. Follow, following Laurel, we can ask, um, can music think on its own terms without the need of philosophy? If so, as a scholar practitioner, can we find a way in which music thought can co-creatively meet philosophical thought? So in this diagram, this is from uh, Burroughs and O'Sullivan. I'm going to read a quote, which uh, helps to describe it. This diagram foregrounds the particular change in vision that non-philosophy entails, a kind of dropping down of philosophical perspective. And with that, we might call a rejigging of the foreground and background relations. Here, it is as if the conceptual material has been laid out on a tabletop. This is not exactly a move from three dimensions to two, but rather a flatness in which there are no supplementary dimensions. This view from above is replaced by something more imminent, and this radical change in perspective enables a different treatment of philosophy. So according to this diagram, the liberated materials, which are three, in the diagram are all equalized rendering all materials or thought forms equal. In this presentation, this will be explored as the problematic site of individual and collective individuation throughout the paper. So interesting questions that are, arise from this are um, through rejecting the philosophical decision. How do we overcome some kind of a flatland relativistic or nihilistic perspective? Um, also, how to cultivate knowledge from this perspective um, or this milieu of a problematic site through these materials and becomings. And lastly, how to build a new future with these liberated materials. I love you. See you in a few hours. Okay. Okay, here's another diagram. Um, so based on this diagram, we can see how knowledge production from this posture changes. By refusing the philosophical decision, one doesn't allow what we normally call thinking, um, according to a dogmatic image of thought, to intervene in order to think about a subject or object, but through a spontaneous action of unilateral performativity and causality, Laurel calls determination in the last instance. Um, one non-thetically performs a creative solution to a problematic field of individuation. So this site refuses the authority of any one master or meta discourse, which is uh, depicted here in two, and therefore changes perspective we go from one directly to three. We can see that's not a dotted line. 
uh, rendering all thoughts and other materials to be equally equal and unequal. Um, and this creates the space of four, which he calls fictioning. Okay, so this the conditions of thought, axiomatic versus problematic formalization. So from this theoretical understanding, we can now more formally understand how we are breaking from transcendental models based on axiomatic universals, axiomatic methods, um, which I mentioned is also called a dogmatic image of thought, to models of imminent knowledge. And that's based on the model of the problematic. Each uh, uh, approach leads to different kinds of formalization procedures and generates different kinds of knowledges. An imminent approach to the conditions of thought must be born from experience and not and not deduced from a priori givens. Therefore, the dogmatic of Im image of thought starts with an axiom um, and proceeds to describe a problematic. For example, Platonic transcendental ideas or Kantian transcendental idealism. So Laurel inverts this order so as to start with a problematic encounter or event in which no solution is pre-given. It starts with real conditions and gives rise to abstractions through finding ideas from these unique and imminent conditions. Gil Deleuze, a contemporary thinker of Laurel, is also a thinker of imminence and deeply theorized the dogmatic image, image of thought in his uh, 1960, uh, 1968 book, Difference and Repetition, and, and is aiming to, to, to work and overcome the same problem and, and privilege and foreground the problematic here. Here, he is helpful to help think through the differences between axiomatic and problematic form, formalization. So in this diagram or in this slide here, we can see um, how they are, are different. So axiomatic starts with pre-given a priori. They can they exist independent of experience. Uh, there's closed system. It leads to major sciences uh, like Euclidean geometry, for example. And in Deleuze's language, um, he he thinks through extensive and intensive magnitudes. And so extensive magnitude is a qualitative, uh, a, a rational deduction and a representation. Um, cardinal numbers are one way to understand this, and this is uh, privileged by the, the rational and analytical logics of sense, and ideas are come first, the axioms here. Problematic, as we can see on the right side, is a posteriori. It's an open system, it's rooted in empirical conditions, um, and it's uh, intensive magnitudes, um, which is felt through sensations and is a qualitative multiplicity. Ordinal numbers are a better example, first, second, for instance. Um, and this is uh, privileges sensation. And from this perspective, ideas organize problematics into axioms. So we can see how we're rejuggling the order of things here. Okay, so quickly, we're going to go through the sort of the summary of this method from my perspective. So from the perspective of a scholar practitioner, we must first identify our problematic field of becoming, which is performative and affective. From these conditions, we intuit the idea of the problematic, and from this formulate non-sufficient hypotheses in which, uh, which organize experimental axioms, non-sufficient axioms from a non-philosophical perspective, which can generate uh, experimental uh, individual and collective individuation. Okay. So heretical in, in, in individuation. So non-philosophy here acts as a new posture of experimentation beyond epistemic and authoritative boundaries, which overdetermine potentialities and possibilities within uh, the normative and classical models of thinking and subjectivity. This new posture Laurel calls a stranger subjectivity and opens to a new future imaginaries based on the method of fictioning. I feel this can also be called heretical individuation because it aims pr to produce novel and new um, beyond any authority, unleashing creative imagination beyond epistemic boundaries. Here's a, a fantastic quote from our chair, Debashish Banerjee, quote, our imagination operates to start with within epistemic bounds. This means there is an unthought to our thought, which we take for granted, just as a fish may imagine different forms of, of ocean life, but not a life on land, unless it either finds its experience extended by circumstance to include land, or its imagination receives a jolt or a bolt of lightning that pushes it out of its epistemic shell into a new quantum of perception. Yet such things do happen, 
and the pioneers who imagine from such out of the box conditions begin to give us new ideas and new epistems along um, along with which to imagine. So this section is called axiomatic heresy. We're breaking axioms here, fabulating and or fictioning a people to come. Okay. So now that we have arrived at the ruins of philosophy and are beginning to understand how to free ourselves from the dogmatic image of thought and the philosophical decision, there remains a question of how to proceed. Are all thoughts equal? Are all materials equal? How do we avoid that relativistic and uh, flat land? Um, of course, this is not this is the opposite of what Laurel and Deleuze are trying to accomplish. And so far, I've outlined the deconstructive process in this method, and we'll now embark upon the constructive process in building ourselves outside of an authoritative or dogmatic image of thought. So where do we uh, begin our reconstructive process? What is our, cult our current cultural problematic? What axioms don't serve us, like capitalism? How do we find and generate problematics? Uh, how do we find new ideas within these um, problematics? How do we create concepts, find new new affects, and set new axioms that can help make new futures? I'll now turn to Deleuze to think more about the, the role of the arts in fictioning a new future. So, quote, the more our daily life appears standardized, automated, and that's also, think axiom here, stereotyped and subject to an accelerated reproduction of objects of consumption, the more art must be injected into it in order to extract from it a little difference. It's an act of resistance against and an act of struggle against the separation of the profane and sacred. This act of resistance in music ends with a cry. Here's a quote from Laurel. Art is the world without the world, the entire world, but without its overdetermining concept. Okay. Okay. So here's a slide called Mythopoesis and the People to Come. So Deleuze, in his books on cinema, speaks about a people to come in which art, understood as a logic of affect, is an important aspect in the invention of a shared future. So, quote, this is, this is a quote not on the page. The, this acknowledgement of a people who are missing is not a renunciation of a political cinema but on the contrary, a new basis on which it is founded in the third world and for minorities. Art, and especially cinemata cinema graphic art, must take part in this task, not that of addressing a people, which is presupposed and already there, but of con contributing to the invention of a people. And this quote on the page is um, coming from O'Sullivan and Burroughs and is about the future-orientedness um, of fabulation and fiction. So mythopoesis names a collective enunciation in a sense, one that is for a people, even when there is only a single reader or participant, but also from a people, even, I'll read from the screen, even when there is a parent, oh, sorry, yes, uh, it names a strange temporality. This temporality involves a particular kind of feedback loop in which future images of people and worlds are manifested within the present in order to call forth new times and relations from within this, uh, from within what is perceived or said to exist. Hi, Jonathan, uh, just under five minutes. Okay, let's go here. We're, uh, so sono fictioning a trans uh, individual sound body. Okay, so this is, this section discusses what I call sono fictioning in my practice. Um, and, um, Okay, so so Bernard Stiegler uh, is has launched a critique of digital cap algorithmic capitalism, which shows how the culture industries have short circuited individuation um, individually and collectively. So how can we avoid this capture? This is where I'm kind of starting in my practice. Um, how can art provide new potentials to make a different world? Um, and how can the sonic arts help generate individual and collective individuation aimed at trans individuation? So trans individuation is a concept by Gilbert Simondon. And here's a beautiful quote by uh, uh, Dr. Banerjee describing this metaphysical posture and how it can generate the conditions for tra uh, trans individuation. 
Yet what connects them to each higher assemblage is a common imagined ideal, which is the trans individual integ integrating them all. Such a trans individual cannot be named or known until integrally experienced. In our times, the collective attractor of such an, an ideal is a vanishing point that may be called a, the plane of imminence, whose philosophical definition is the identity of radical plurality and absolute unity. This must be experienced uniquely and a plurality that goes all the way down and trans individuates towards the open whole of the plane of imminence, which lies always already and unique, uniquely in each element. Working together in a polis of the future that supports an ethos and interpretation, forming unique individual and collective becomings towards the embodiment of such a trans individual is the imagination of the unthought within the thought of our times. So for me, the practice of sonal fictioning is directly tied to this question of, of the people to come, of the, the trans individual. And so I've, uh, I'm, I've drawn a diagram here I'd like to share with you. Um, so Deleuze demands us that we think, or demands that we think ethics, politics, and aesthetics simultaneously from a plane of imminence, um, as we just heard about, as a condition for trans individuation. And so this diagram is part of my practice. Um, and we can see this diagram for me in my practice has helped me build minor genealogies, um, kind of discovering a uh, becoming minor through music. It places multiple centers in resonance circuits to create long circuit transgenerational circuits of trans individuation. And it aims to transgress the short circuits of the culture industries. And so, um, this, this, you, we can see here. There's a line, the line of individuation, sub, subjectification, subjectivation. It's and it's kind of I'm, I'm looking at this becoming. This line is the, the line of flight or the becoming. And this is, this is a, a place where these, these cat, these are not categories or rational categories. They're, they're more, they're more affective categories in which we are kind of transducing or putting them into experimental relationships and. So I find it really important to consider consider these three: the aesthetic, political, and ethical. As I'm um, as I'm doing sonal fictioning as a practice, it also takes into consideration in the first uh, uh, triangle here: the I, the we, and the they. The they here is the represents the culture industries, the the forces that are not serving us in the world. And I'm going to play quickly a. Uh, a piece from William Parker's. When I was in school, I noticed uh, that there was great wisdom and knowledge in the sky. Shortly after that, the sky translated itself into music, the tone world. It swallowed me up the way a whale would swallow up a guppy dipped in mama's homemade tomato sauce. It is through sound that I learned how to live to live, I have become one with the mystery, and it is an overwhelming project. The closer you get, the further you are away from it. The closer you get, the further you are away from it. Then one day my father came home with a saxophone and a brown wooden case. I got you a soprano sax. It was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen in my life, in my life. The next week I was sent to the Cosmic Music School, where I was trained in all aspects of healing through sound, trance systems, tone systems, heartbeat codes, blues and melodic systems, harmonic systems, compassion systems, myth and dream systems, ritual systems, mystery music systems, celestial music systems, spiritual music systems, ceremonial music systems. It was a revelation, this study. Learning that life. Okay. And I think uh, William Parker demonstrates so beautifully this, this, this practice. And I think we can understand and learn through his life and his work um, 
one of many artists in my life, but somebody who's practicing sonal fictioning, involving this, these three aesthetic, ethical, and political, and and um, and he's a huge inspiration for me. I just wanted to share that to end. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Thanks, Jonathan. That was wonderful. Okay, uh, we're going to push forward. As with the other panels, we'll hold questions and comments till the end. Uh, so the next presenter, Alex Stein, uh, explores the many faceted nature of consciousness and the cosmos through the lens of hermeticism, tantra, depth psychology, neuroscience, astrology, and psychedelics. His research explores how the mind shapes reality, what lies outside the bounds of our current reality, and how can we learn to let go of assumptions and embrace the freedom of conscious existence? As he has discovered for himself, these questions do not have final answers, but living these questions leads to a more integral, magical, and blissful life. Alex? All right, thanks, Stefan. Um, here we go. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so I'm calling this presentation Mind Spells. And the basic idea that, I'm, that I've got here is that we're essentially casting magical spells with our thinking constantly, whether we know it or not. And now we've all heard this kind of, it's a big new age cliche at this point, this, this phrase, your thoughts create your reality. And it's the kind of thing that, you know, if we swallow it naively, it's like, okay, you know, it's kind of an eye rolling so, sort of a thing. Um, but is there a deeper basis to it? Is there some reality to it that we can, that we can get into? So that's what I want to explore. Um, now, first of all, when we talk about the mind and we talk about thoughts, um, you know, we have a very limited idea of, uh, of what this can be. Right. And part of what we do in, in thinking is, Right, structure our existence, right? And so we build these kinds of structures, like I called it earlier, we're like beavers building dams all the time. Um, but I want to expand, I want to still use these concepts, use these words, but expand the possibility of what they can mean to open into something wider so that we can kind of feel into a, a deeper thing that they're pointing to rather than be limited by them. So if we're thinking your thoughts create your reality, it's worth kind of bearing uh, in, in the back of our mind the questions, you know, who are you? What is reality? And what is a thought? So, you know, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to define thought. And I want you to, to, if I'm talking about thought, I want you to kind of have this notion in mind that it can be any structure or impulse whatsoever in the psyche. So that can include, of course, conceptual thoughts, words, uh, images, memories, uh, that sort of thing, language, but also uh, emotions, instincts. Um, and, and if we're thinking in idealist terms with consciousness as the sort of basis of reality, literally anything that, that we might experience, right? Um, so now this, this is where I want to bring magic in. Okay. So the, my favorite definition of magic comes from Chris Gostin, who says that in magic, people are open to the workings of the universe and the universe is responsive to us. So, you know, ma magical systems of all kinds from anywhere in the world, basically blur the line between inner and outer reality. They, they see a kind of connection between uh, the subjective and objective worlds. And um, you know, tend to sort of map reality in terms of different planes or different worlds or different dimensions, and then uh, seek to find connections between these dimensions, these planes, and to work with these connections to make what otherwise seems improbable happen. Now, um, in the field of parapsychological research, I'm not going to go into much depth on this, but I just want to throw it out there. Um, you know, there have now been over a thousand successful studies over the past hundred or so years in parapsychology, many of which passed the Six Sigma threshold, which in uh, statistics basically 
puts it at an odds against chance of over a trillion to one. So it's like, this is, it's, it's pretty good science, right? That uh, in the fields of like remote viewing, telepathy, precognition, psychokinesis, that basically show like, okay, there's something going on here. There is some kind of dialogue going on between what we think of as the inner and outer worlds. Um, it's still treated by mainstream science as if it's kind of up in the air and, and, and you know, people aren't accepting it and say that, that these studies haven't been replicated when in fact they have, because it really falls outside the paradigm, which of course is a, 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 an example of a kind of deeply held thought uh, creating reality, um, that in and of itself. But um, basically I just wanna throw that out there to show that you know this is something that that science is even starting to look at, and and many scientists are are starting to um, acknowledge. Um, but you know we're so used to thinking of magic as something you know wondrous and miraculous and out of the ordinary, but what if it's not just the paranormal that's magic? You know, what if what if it's true that there is this constant dialogue between inner and outer going on? Right. Well, in that case the normal would be just as magical as the paranormal. And so that can lead us to start to think, okay, like, like how is my, my life? How is my expression of my life? How is everything that I think, everything that I feel, everything that I experience, the whole totality of that, a kind of a magical operation constantly unfolding? And how am I the product of that? So, to kind of sum all of this up before I go into some specific stuff, um, we can say, first of all, you know, reality is definitely, however we define it, it's a matter of experience, okay? So whatever we say about ourselves, whatever we say about the world, um, we, we can feel very strongly, for instance, that the material world is it, right? But we're basing that on an experience, right? We're basing that on the experience that matter feels quite real. So, um, you know, and this is where I, idealists come in and like in the field of consciousness studies today, uh, idealist theorists who say, you know, honestly, we're assuming that matter is real. Why don't we go with the one thing that we can be sure of, which is experience and take that as our starting point, okay? So, um, if reality is as we experience it, then we can say with this expanded version of the word thought that it's a matter of assumption of what we're assuming it to be. So these are unquestioned thoughts. And now the more indisputable reality becomes, the stronger the assumption. So for instance, um, I might, I can't exactly pretend that um, I don't assume matter, the, you know, the laws of physics to, to be a thing, right? I can jump off a building and I'll probably fall to the ground, right? No matter how hard I try to change my assumption. However, it doesn't mean that somebody couldn't access a place in consciousness where they were able to bypass these laws. And that's the whole principle of cities or yogic superpowers. Um, so ultimately, it's kind of a matter of probability, like how likely is it that we can change these assumptions? But understanding that things work this way, why hold ourselves so tightly to assuming anything? So now this brings me to the law of attraction, because, you know, this is probably the magical idea that is the most uh, widespread today. It's, it's the most popular. It's been picked up by the culture and, you know, picked up by, by the, the industry. And it's, you know, it's, it's big business, the law of attraction. And it's, you know, we can lodge a lot of complaints against the whole thinking behind it in terms of, you know, the money obsession and, and all of that. Um, but it really is based in, in, you know, kind of age old, uh, magical, um, you know, what I would call real magical thinking. Um, so Neville Goddard, who is one of the kind of, you know, early law of attraction people said, if man's concept of himself were different, everything in his world would be different. And so he was very hardcore about this, you know, just change what you assume reality to be and it will change for you. And now going, um, you know, going further, 
Napoleon Hill wrote in his book, Think and Grow Rich, which was, uh, you know, and still remains one of the really popular law of attraction books. Um, he basically lays the whole concept of it out, saying that the ether in which this little planet floats, in which we move and have our being, is filled with a form of a universal power which adapts itself to the nature of the thoughts we hold in our minds and influences us in natural ways to transmute our thoughts into their physical equivalents. This power makes no attempt to discriminate between destructive and constructive thoughts. It will urge us to translate into physical reality thoughts of poverty just as quickly as it will influence us to act upon thoughts of riches. Our brains become magnetized by the dominating thoughts we hold in our minds. These magnets attract to us the forces, the people, the circumstances of life, which harmonize with the nature of our dominating thoughts. So now one of the dominating thoughts behind the whole law of attraction uh, industry, <laughs> as we call it, is I need money, I need money, I need money, I want money, I want money, you should want money, you should want money, you should want money, right? And of course, that is a thought that's deeply ingrained in us culturally. Um, so, okay, I'll, I'm, I'm not going to really go into all of that right now, but just laying that aside, we can see that, that the magical principle here is, is pretty clear, right? What is, you know, the idea of the inner vibration, right, is going to attract something from the outside to it. Things are going to, the experience is going to shape itself. The world around you is going to shape itself in accordance with that. And this is the basic magical um, uh idea of sympathy, which is essential to, to virtually all magical traditions. And this is the idea that, that in a reality that has multiple planes, right, where we can experience an inner world or an outer world or, um, it, you know, different, different layers within those, um, we're basically intuitively sensing into the correspondences between different realms, right? Now, in the law of attraction, it's the correspondence between the world of thought and, um, and the material world, right? In more, uh, you know, in traditional or like ceremonial magic, um, it might be thought of a little differently. So like Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, who, uh, you, you know, was one of the big magicians of the Renaissance and kind of drew together a whole bunch of stuff into a big compendium of, of magic that kind of influenced magic for the next 500 years. Um, you know, he goes into uh, what they call natural magic, where you're using objects from nature to, to combine to make spells to make something happen. So he gives the example, say, of if you want to create a love spell, you should get an animal that loves, like a turtle dove, you should get its uh, sex organs and you should get those at a time when it's mating and you should combine these together and you should do this when Venus is in the right alignment, Venus, the planet of love, and do the right thing and, you know, your, your will be effective. Um, now, I, I don't recommend anybody go and do that. Um, and, and you can see, of course, that, you know, the law of attraction is much more geared toward uh, you, you know, a, a modern <laughs> mindset, a post-scientific kind of a mindset than, than Agrippa's. But um, anyway, now, one of the keys in, in this, right, whether we're talking law of attraction, whether we're talking Agrippa or anything else, is the idea of faith, right? Um, which, which I see as basically trust in these assumptions, right? That, that, you go deep enough and we all have some faith in something, right? There's something that we unquestioningly trust. And this is one of the keys to, to the outcome. Um, Hill, Napoleon Hill says, faith is the eternal elixir which gives life and power uh, and action to the impulse of thought. And then um, Agrippa, you know, writing about 500 years earlier says, since such great things are possible with steadfast belief, miracles can even be performed by false operations and opinions. Hesitant belief and disbelief invalidates the desired effect, even though the experiment might be very strong. So basically what Agrippa is saying here is, you know, you can be, you know, chanting all the right words and, you, you know, you got the things from the turtle dove and you mix them up at the right time with Venus. But if you don't believe it, 
nothing's going to happen. But on the other hand, you might be doing uh, great, um, or, or you might not, you might believe it very strongly and not have all that stuff in place and get your effect. So, yes. Now, when we apply this to to ourselves, right? Um, think, okay, what is it? Where is that faith, that unquestioned faith in us? And, and how does that get, is it possible to leverage that? Is it possible to change that, right? So of course this comes from paradigms, this comes from cultural assumptions, this comes from what we consider to be common sense or our lived experience. Um, so as I already kind of noted, right? The law of attraction is formulated in scientific language, right? And it's coming out of the 20th century. And so it's like, okay, that makes sense. That's gonna speak to more people than the language of ceremonial magic, which um, although it's, you know, people practice ceremonial magic, it's very fringe thing in relation to law of attraction, um, which is more rooted in, in a religious uh, atmosphere from which it arose. So, but this idea of, of can we do better, you know, do we need to be slaves to our paradigm, to our culture? Uh, to our our experience, to our basic assumptions about ourselves, uh, that is a that's one of the essential questions I think in magical practice. Um, okay, Alex, so now five five minutes. Okay. Um, so one of the things that that really comes up here, anytime somebody tries to to you know make something happen, right, and and all of this positive thinking type of stuff. Um, inevitably faces us with the fact that whatever the mind is, is a hell of a lot bigger than, than we uh, think it is, right? For the most part. Um, so Jung would agree with the basic idea that I'm putting out here, which is that, that experience is the basis of anything we can talk about because it's all an experience. Um, and of course, Jung gave us the concept of the shadow. And you know, if somebody's sitting there trying to do positive thinking and manifest, 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 chances are they're going to have to deal with this. You know, and Jung here says, when one tries desperately to be good and wonderful and perfect, then all the more the shadow develops a definite will to be black and evil and destructive. People cannot see that. They're always striving to be marvelous. And then they discover terrible, destructive things happen, which they cannot understand. And they either deny that such facts have anything to do with them, or if they admit them, they take them for natural afflictions or they try to minimize them and shift the responsibility elsewhere. The fact is that if one tries beyond one's capacity to be perfect, the shadow descends into hell and becomes the devil. So as far as living in a magical world, you know, whether we're magicians, you know, and, and we actively do magic or we try to manifest things or we try to make anything happen. If we if, if we're even just trying to make a better world like we're all trying to do here, right? We start to see that that when we're approaching it purely from the level of the mind, we're in a labyrinth. I mean, there is no end to the structures that will just proliferate my you know structure upon structure upon structure upon structure. So what to do, right? Now, the idea always in these traditions has been around Gnosis um, and, and similar in both Eastern and Western traditions. And I'm just in the context of this, I'm looking at hermetic Gnosis, but you know, the idea is that basically it's absolute direct knowledge and insight into reality itself leading to a spiritual rebirth that it's essentially a bypassing of all of those structures and then just a knowing, right? Who you are, who reality is, what the mind really is beyond um, this, this machine that's always building these structures. And the interesting thing, of course, is that, you know, as, as mystics have always attested, when you tap into the, this dimension of, uh, of, of consciousness, you know, magical powers do manifest. And that's the idea of the cities, uh, which are attested to also in the Western tradition. So, um, so you know, the, the question then becomes, 
you know, what to do upon return, right? If, if you have a practice that brings you to gnosis, whether it's through meditation or psychedelics or, or prayer or whatever, or just being in nature, then what is the, the job of the little mind, right? The one that's working with concepts and forming ideas and perspectives. And I think it's the way that I like to imagine it is like, it's like a hand on the rudder, right? That, that we don't know what reality is. The mind is not supposed to actually figure this out. It's just to be a hand on the rudder in this infinite existence that we, that we live in. Um, so now just to, to close this up, um, you know, Dean Radin in his book, Real Magic, he says that the essence of magic boils down to the application of two ordinary mental skills, attention and intention. And so when a magical practitioner is trying to make something happen, right, they will hone their attention and they will focus their intention and, and enter gnosis and come back and do this, right? Now, the question in the ordinary sense, in this existence that is constantly 100% all the time magical, is what is it that draws our attention? And what is it that is that is intending through us? And, and can we get a sense of what shapes our attention and intention at all times? Um, and finally, you know, before we think, speak, act, do anything, we can ask ourselves, what spell? am I about to cast? So that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Tyler. That was wonderful. Okay, folks, uh, moving right along. Um, we turn to the final presenter uh, for the symposium, for this panel and for the symposium, uh, Paige, um, Paige Barrows. Um, Paige has just graduated with her master's degree from the East-West Psychology Department. Uh, her scholarly accomplishments include graduating with honors from UCLA, where she studied history and math, and attaining fluency in ancient Greek at the University of Pennsylvania. As an educational consultant, Paige helps anxious teens unleash their brilliancy in math in her private practice in San Francisco. As a spiritual practitioner, she has pursued the diamond approach and Kabbalah, as well as advanced systems of intuitive knowing. Paige became a certified consultant in the Akashic Wisdom School of Knowing in 2017, as well as a spirit-led practitioner with, uh, excuse me if I don't pronounce this correctly, Janai Lane in 2019. Paige has recently combined her long-held interest in tarot with Jung's theory of synchronicity and the non-dual as she contemplates why divination is so accurate. Hi, Paige. Thank you, Professor Ulick. Is my headset working? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Terrific. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Such a scintillating set of presentations. <laughs> it's really fun, Alex, to hear your, your thoughts, spells work again. Um, I'm honored to be included in this panel and it's exciting to dive into this paper topic with you today. It's one I began to explore um, in Professor Ulick's delightful class this past fall and I'm still in the early stages of exploring it. So <laughs> you'll come along for the ride. Um, my paper is entitled Archetypes Arising, the Potential of Divination to Further Individuation. And as I began, I have a few slides, slides to share with you visually to anchor my talk, but it's not meant to be a set of sequential slides that correspond to each talking point. So I'll go ahead and um, let's see, share that. Okay, are you seeing the first slide? Okay. We're seeing, seeing the yes. slide plus your notes, right? Oh, you're seeing my notes. Hmm. Yeah. That's really disappointing. Okay. Um, okay, how about now? Yeah. Great, okay, thanks so much. Um, all right, so my presentation explores Jung's concept of synchronicity and extends it to divination practices, including the I Ching and tarot. 
According to Jung, synchronicity refers to the coincidence of events in time and space as meaning something more than mere chance. This paper will explore the possibility that the results of a tarot reading can be considered an intersection of psyche and the material world where archetypal messages and symbols from the collective unconscious are revealed to the querent, the one asking, in a moment of time. While the tarot has its own unique history with a myriad of interpretations and uses for both divination and fortune telling, its highest function is arguably attained when it's used in service of the Jungian quest for individuation. From this framework, when cards are pulled, the querent trusts that the symbolism and messages that arise reflect underlying archetypes at work and the querent psyche and life at that moment. Using scholarly personal narrative, I will discuss my own use of divination to work with unconscious material that was contributing to my suffering and how consulting tarot expanded my perspective and relieved my discomfort. The power of archetypal images. So in Jungian terms, the rational Western mindset falsely separates us from the collective unconscious and the power of the archetypal layer. Without rising to this level of engagement, the querent risks missing the deeper point of a reading. This includes the opportunity to observe and interact with images and symbols arising in the moment, and perhaps even interact with archetypal images, their properties and stories. The seeker of divination has the rich opportunity to work with this unconscious material and make it conscious as well as to identify mythic figures and amplify their role in the matter at hand. Jung believed this process could assist in the individuation process by which the capital S self reveals itself to the ego. If instead of this approach, the querent rejects the results of divination with an intellectual arrogance rooted firmly in rational postmodern beliefs, this chance is lost. Among other results, such a diminishment may delay individuation. Worse, the querent may continue to be influenced by unhelpful archetypal patterns emerging from their excuse me, unconscious, likely causing suffering in their lives and keeping them stuck in their current level of awareness. As Jung states, modern man does not understand how much his rationalism which has destroyed his capacity to respond to numinous symbols and ideas, has put him at the mercy of the psychic underworld. Another common approach to divination that limits its potential comes from the cause and effect mindset. And this approach, an oracle system such as Tarot, is used to obtain favorable outcomes for the seeker's actions in the space-time continuum. While this approach can be valuable, it overlooks the archetypal layer and its potent offerings for transformation. Contemporary teacher of Western magical traditions, Donald Craig, describes divination as the process of discerning what will probably happen if you continue on the path you are currently traversing. Rooted in free will, the querent receives information from tarot cards which gives them, quote, the freedom to ensure something happens or to prevent it from occurring, to quote Craig. While this serves as a helpful function, it does not usually lend itself to penetrating the deeper layers of consciousness, and therefore it does not hold much promise to elevate or expand them. On the other hand, the Jungian theoretical view of divination elevates the use of tarot and the I Ching to reflect the soul's movement toward wholeness, referred to as of individuation. From this framework, the seeker has the opportunity to intentionally expand their consciousness by recognizing the themes at play underneath the events in their lives. The cynical, rational-minded parent may pursue a reading as a novelty and then assimilate it with their ego mind. Rather than recognizing the jewels the reading might contain concerning individuation, the ego classifies such an experience as merely having had a tarot reading. However, 
if the Claren opens to the messages from the unconscious layer that emerge in the reading and recognizes the themes, symbols, and even archetypal patterns or myth at play in the reading and their lives, rich opportunities for illumination and growth can result. Such approach to divination offers the Claren the chance to identify an archetypal image presenting as a recognizable myth in their life circumstance or psyche. This might be facilitated by the tarot reader and their interpretation of the results, or by the querent, the one asking if they're drawing their own cards. With such recognition comes awareness of the patterns at play, and through this witnessing, the expansion of consciousness. It is an all-chemical psychological process defined by synchronicity rather than linear causality. Jung incorporates concepts from physics to elucidate this concept. Since experience has shown that under certain conditions, space and time can be reduced to almost zero, causality disappears along with them because causality is bound up with the existence of space and time and physical changes and consists essentially in the succession of cause and effect. For this reason, synchronistic phenomena cannot in principle be associated with any conceptions of causality. And I feel like the, the recent developments in astrophysics with entanglement theory would, would have rocked Jung's world and will provide further really interesting kind of mergers of this kind of spirituality and science moving forward as more is revealed. Beneficial outcomes from this approach to divination um, could include the Quarant's ability to work with the myth or archetypal image present in the reading, and through thoughtful reflection and insight, change or rework the dynamics of the story to a higher level outcome. This might entail working with the part of the Quarant's hidden inner life, now made conscious, to create a more appropriate and desirable outcome to the situation. Such an approach presents an opportunity comparable to that of engaging in parts work with the internal family system theoretical framework developed by Richard C. Schwartz. The results can include growth, expanding consciousness, and steps taken along the individuation journey. It should be noted that the consciousness of the reader and the querent affect the clarity of the symbols and archetypes revealed and how they are interpreted in the container of the divination practice. In the best case scenario, the querent would deepen their access to the self through the reading. Personal reflection, the art opening. So I had an experience a few years ago when working with an uncomfortable emotion that abruptly surfaced. My partner and I had been dating for about a year or so when a friend of his invited him to an art opening debuting her latest work. I couldn't attend due to a work commitment he planned to go without me in support of her. I was startled by the amount of jealousy that came up for me over this prospect. But in the spirit of complete truth and authenticity that characterizes our relationship, he had previously confessed fleeting, but occasional attraction to her. This had never been acted upon as she'd been married to another man during the duration of their years long friendship. Moreover, he assured me she'd always had immaculate platonic boundaries with him. Were this not the case, he explained that she possessed the combination of qualities that he'd always hoped to find in a partner. Compassion, warmth, sparkle, creativity, kindness, inner and outer beauty. I understood why he would have felt drawn towards her at times. She's a lovely and delightful person whose warmth and artistic talent delight all who meet her. Given their strictly platonic relationship, however, the intensity and sudden arrival of my envy seemed completely unfounded. My rational mind craved an explanation and I was un uncomfortable with this strong shadow emotion at play. So I engaged in divination, hoping to find relief and answers. From a union perspective, divination is enhanced by, quote, a receptivity marked by non-attachment with the releasing of prejudices and preconceptions, which allow the reader to become, quote, open to archetypal possibilities, known as quoted in Cambrai. Therefore, in seeking answers, and as a way to lessen my jealousy, I meditated for a few minutes, then shuffled my druid prattle deck. 
I'll do the cards with my eyes closed using intuition to sense which cards to pull, then place them in the traditional Celtic cross format. Astonishingly, the resulting tarot cards included the Princess of Cups, representing the artist, the Queen of Pentacles, representing myself, and the King of Hearts, representing an aspect of my partner. Working with the symbolism and archetypal images of the cards that emerged and using a process of amplification, like one might with dream imagery, an entire story arose from the reading. What emerged was the story of an imbalanced royal family during the Renaissance period. The Princess of Cups was adored by all, sheltered and indulged in every sort of creative outlet and lesson. She played the harpsichord in the rose garden of the castle and mastered drawing and painting with watercolors. Her elder sister, the hardworking queen, was drowning in duties and pressing responsibilities. But in spite of her challenging role, the queen's deepest affection was with her younger sister, the princess. Her errant husband, the king of hearts, was an indulgent philanderer who drank and romanced his way through the kingdom while his wife, the queen of pentacles, ran the entire kingdom from behind the throne. The queen was bitter, exhausted, martyred, and frustrated by the patriarchal system in which her husband had enjoyed the power and glory of his position while she did all the work. I was able to see that in many ways I had embodied themes from the Queen of Pentacles plight. My life was overly encumbered at the time by my work commitments as a single woman in San Francisco in private practice. My clients were the children of titans of tech and finance living in castles in Pacific Heights, kings of Silicon Valley. I had suppressed my princess of cups qualities, both my feminine nature and artistic side by being overly focused on my business and clients. This was a much more linear and less colorful outlet for my creativity than my soul craved. I dreamed of a more balanced life in which I could express the yin and yang qualities of my soul appropriately, and in particular, my artistic nature. I longed to live where I could be more actively creative, feminine, and romantically realized, um, and to embody that kind of archetype. This friend of my partner's had done that somehow. She was magnetic, compassionate, beautiful, and highly creative. She was a realized artist whom I admired, a woman who lived in the San Francisco Bay Area with its myriad of demands, <clears throat> but still made time for her art, excuse me. I saw <clears throat> that I was envious of her ability to prioritize her creativity, even as I liked and admired her. The king and queen cards in my reading actually reflected the imbalance within my own inner royal couple. Jung describes the queen and king as archetypal images used by the self to reach the surface of the mind's awareness. In his collected works, Jung states, because of its unconscious component, the self is so far removed from the conscious mind that can only be partially expressed by human figures. The other part has to be expressed by objective abstract symbols. The human figures are father and son, mother and daughter, king and queen, god and goddess. Myself was similarly reaching through the unconscious layer with symbolic representations of my situation. And the story that unfolded within the archetypal images revealed by the cards, I was able to see that both within my psyche and life circumstances, my inner queen took on the many responsibilities of running the kingdom. The king, meanwhile, had plenty of time for recreation and romance, just not with her. It was an embittering situation. The advice and action cards I drew included encouragement to nourish and protect my creativity. The spread culminated in the powerful Ace of Wands card, which invited me to use my life force and will to initiate action toward my sole purpose. The lasting takeaway was not about an actual threat to my new relationship, but rather how much I needed to honor my own creative urges and create a sanctuary for my heart, younger innocent self and inner artist. It's quite a process to work with this material, but by the end of the evening, my jealousy had abated and I was able to listen with genuine interesting care as my partner described the art opening with admiration, all, all while keeping my heart open to both him and our artistic friend. 
The reading helped me shift several rigid inner structures, offering the benefits of alchemy as I entertained its archetypal imagery and the story they revealed, the one I had been trapped in without even realizing it. Perhaps my reading was more potent and accurate because I was genuinely seeking a higher perspective and the inner growth that would help me understand and integrate the jealousy, which had hitherto been hiding out in the shadow of my unconscious. As Brant Courtright states in his book, Psychotherapy and Spirit, quote, when being on a spiritual path becomes a conscious decision and pursuit, everything changes. Outer circumstances begin to yield to the inner spirit and the way opens up. Consciousness becomes engaged in its transformation, end quote. Divination page, can be page, a powerful instrument of such transformation. Sorry, Paige, about four minutes. Oh, okay, great. Um, so divination is an expression of non-duality. In the divination process, having an empty mind can be helpful for achieving clarity of outcome and accessing archetypal matter for both clarent and reader. It's possible and even likely for the reading to be transpersonal in nature when two people are involved. At the highest levels, it can even reveal the morphic or intersubjective field between both participants, even their non-dual nature. Whenever readings involve two or more people, rather than just drawing cards for oneself, the concept of the intersubjective field arises. While primarily used in psychoanalytic settings to describe the shared psychic matter between therapist and client, it also fits within the context of divination addressed in this paper. There's much to unravel and contemplate in this interplay of spirit, matter, and psyche. And this paper attempts to open the subject for further inquiry and discussion. I'm grateful for the opportunity I've had to delve deeply into these subjects in the course of our class this past fall, preparing this paper and now giving this presentation as I've been interested in this for several years. Jung's exposure to the tarot led to his musings on the major arcana cards at a seminar on active imagination in 1933, quote, you see man always felt the need of finding an access through the unconscious to the meaning of an actual condition because there's a sort of correspondence or a likeness between the prevailing condition and collective unconscious, end quote. Um, so I think the most uh, astounding, do I still have a couple of minutes? I can also just stop here. I think um, one of the most astounding experiences I've had of um, just having divination sort of tap into the greater morphic field was in my first semester in the East-West master's program um, and Professor Jun Wang's introduction to Chinese uh, philosophy and psychology. And she presented the I Ching uh, to the class. And I remember that Jung had written the introduction to the Wilhelm Bain's version of the I Ching. And I was sort of excited about that and, and offered to present the I Ching to the class. Honestly, I did a terrible job. I didn't really yet understand what was required as a graduate student to give a presentation to the class. But it was, gosh, mid, I'm gonna say mid to late February, 2020, we were meeting on campus and um, she had me just flip through the book and open to the um, hexagram that seemed to be calling me in the class. And she reminded me at the East West party in February for those of us who were local, which I'd completely forgotten that I landed on, um, Hexagram 52 kin, keeping still mountain, above, keeping still mountain, below, keeping still mountain. Everything, the, the six aspects of this hexagram um, all refer to keeping still, the end of movement, keeping still, keeping his back still so that he no longer feels his body he goes into his courtyard and does not see his people, no blame. Each aspect of this has to do with keeping still, staying home, staying within, and no blame. And Professor Wang uh, reminded me that, that this um, I Ching reading came up 
for the class about three weeks before we were all blindsided by the shelter in place edict, which then you know, defined the rest of that class in that year and obviously the, the several years since. So I think there is an extraordinary capacity at times for divination to even sort of tap into the broadest and largest morphing field that exists, which is, you know, that of humanity in a given moment. So thank you so much. What fun to share this with you. I really appreciate you all staying present for my presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pete. That looked wonderful. I also want to uh, just share a moment from the class. You you showed the uh, the reading, the the three card reading from. Um, I, I wrote it down here, and of course I've lost it now. The uh, the deck, the Druidcraft tarot deck, and I remember in class that I had had a dream the night before, and somehow the way that those cards came up for you in that reading, and that you shared with the class. It, it kind of explicated my dream perfectly. And this reminded me at the, at the, in the moment of exactly what you were talking about now, the, the potential and the um, ability of uh, divination techniques and the tarot especially, I, I'm drawn to images myself. So the uh, tarot and divination cards are very important in my own personal work, but the ability to, to open up the intersubjective space uh, and I just thought th there was just that moment of magic in the class on magic, which I thought was magical. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I guess just to kind of go over, I mean, there's just so much here. And uh, I guess um, for full disclosure, my brain's not working very well for the last couple of days. I've been having allergies, so I'm a little fuzzy headed. So I'm going to try and like encapsulate this in a way that makes sense uh, to folks. I was struck by something that um, that uh, Hema said actually in the last panel, uh, she quoted Hillman, Hema, I think it was you who quoted Hillman, um, that beauty is the way that God touches our senses, reaches the heart and attracts us into life. So it's kind of a strange attractor that, straight, strange attractor that pulls us into life. And for me, the heart is really central to all of this. There's the image in, uh, you know, maybe the most classic image from uh, Tarot uh, cards from the um, the Smith uh, the Smith drawing from the Weight Rider deck of the magician, right, holding one arm up and the other arm down, uniting the worlds within their own body. And to me, this is a really kind of archetypal and very seminal image about how, uh, in Jung's way of looking at it, we are. We are standing amidst uh, a field of opposites that manifest for us whenever we observe what's outside or within us. And it's uh, the job of the individual, if you want to look at it in that way, to unite the, the oppositions. Now, it's very possible that we're moving out of that archetypal paradigm as we move into the age of Aquarius, where the image is more of the individual who's holding the spirit in a container close to their body uh, as opposed to the the two fish that are kind of at war with one another Jung talks about them as the warring brothers but right now where i live and in my own body the it's a constant attempt to um basically living in a, a state of uh thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis. And the synthesis always happens within the body and, and divination uh, cards are a really wonderful way as are dreams uh, and um, many arts-based approaches of helping us move into that space and move into the intersubjective and then be able to kind of knit together all the opposites that are appearing in our field of awareness. Um, Another thing that I wanted to say about this uh, um, panel for me, which was kind of neat and fully understanding that each one of us, not only the people who are um, observing uh, the audience, but also the participants themselves could read this in a completely different way. But just to kind of say, talk about the way that I was carried through these three, I saw a red thread or kind of a, a, a through narrative that I think is kind of speaking to stuff that's happening 
for me within in my life right now and in my inner life i i really felt that jonathan set up quite beautifully a lot of the philosophical issues that uh that we're dealing with in a very broad way which also linked back to all of the other talks that occurred in the other three panels uh overriding themes that uh, we deal with in east-west psychology all kind of held within an integral paradigm um, an integral paradigm that attempts to weave together all of these disparate elements and then i thought that it was kind of neat that from there for me anyway that alex was the next speaker and then alex kind of zeroed in on magic which is my personal path so uh it was really kind of nice that we went from this very broad for me from this very broad kind of category where lots of things are happening lots of ideas are kind of percolating into a, a lens with through which i tend to see things my lens is magical but also union and um and then to come to page and to focus in on divinatory work and uh i try in my classes to you know i asked students to kind of keep a journal and to do this type of work keep a dream journal and to do have some form of divinatory practice and i know alex also does astrology so uh an astrological practice on a daily basis or drawing cards which is what i do every morning as a way to read the moment to read the moment that we're in and uh because the whether it's astrology or um or, or a divination practice such as tarot or even cartomancy i use that often uh drawing from a book or i use a calendar that has aphorisms by the mother and sri aurobindo and each day a, a new aphorism comes up and i'm always amazed at how uh it directly kind of points to something that's happening within me now maybe i'm i'm being overly flexible and saying oh yeah i can find a way to fit that in but i don't think so that when you enter into uh when you enter into kind of a magical mindset and i think that you find that everywhere in our program and even in our school so it's not you don't just have to like study classes on magic it's there in everything that we study then the synchronicities begin to happen the intersubjective space opens we begin to see that life is an unfolding miracle and we deepen our connection not only to uh, ourselves but others and also to others other beings which includes nature the world around us and nature including the physical and the subtle um so so much going on i i also because i'm because i'm the last person to speak i thought that i really should just uh honor not only the speakers in this panel who i really enjoyed listening to but the speakers in all of the other panels and i wanted to share something that came up um in the moment uh i'm being mindful of what jonathan was talking about this kind of tension between uh i want to get this right down the the tension between experience and dogma you know the experience which is that's generated in the moment the intersubjective space that opens up between us when we're in direct and honest and uh open relationship with one another open hearts open minds and uh, a more dogmatic way of approaching where i you know maybe carry in a predetermined thing to say uh and i and i i i worried over this today because as i said my mind is a little fuzzy and i thought well maybe if i prepare something in advance but i couldn't do it because i wanted to honor what was what was coming up and so much was coming up just over the last two days just watching all of the panelists so i wanted to share something i mean maybe this is a little dogmatic because i'm going to something that was written by uh written by you and this is uh something that i think that uh it's a it's a fairly famous passage and many people in in the room might already know it but i think that it's worth reading again it's very short and uh this is happened to him when he was in africa on a place that's called the athi plains in nairobi outside of nairobi and it's uh if you read uh barbara hanna's book her biography of jung she calls this one of the five enlightenment experiences that he had when he was on his journey to africa he says that from nairobi we used a, a small ford to visit the athi plains a great game preserve from a low hill in this broad savanna a magnificent prospect opened out to us 
in the very brink, to the very brink of the horizon, we saw gigantic herds of animals, gazelle, antelope, new, zebra, warthog, and so on, grazing, heads nodding, herds moving forward like slow rivers. There was scarcely any sound save the melancholy cry of a bird of prey. This was the stillness of the eternal beginning, the world as it had always been in the state of non-being. For until then, no one had been present to know that it was this world. I walked away from my companions until I had put them out of sight and savored the feeling of being entirely alone. There I was now, the first human being to recognize that this was the world, but who did not know that in this moment, he had first really created it. There, the cosmic meaning of consciousness became overwhelmingly clear to me. What nature leaves imperfect, the art perfects, says the alchemist. Man, the human being, I, in an invisible act of creation, put the stamp of perfection on the world by giving it objective existence. This act we usually ascribe to the creator alone without considering that in so doing, we view life as a machine calculated down to the last detail, which along with the human psyche runs on senselessly obeying foreknown and predetermined rules. In such a cheerless clockwork fantasy, there is no drama of the human being, the world and God. There is no new day leading to new shores, but only the dreariness of calculated processes. My old Pueblo friend came to my mind. He thought that the raison d'etre of his Pueblo had been to help the father, the son to cross the sky each day. I had envied him for the fullness of the meaning in that belief and had been looking about without hope for a myth of our own. And now I knew what it was and knew even more that man is indispensable for the completion of creation, that in fact, he himself is the second creator of the world who alone has given to the world its objective existence, without which unheard, unseen, silently eating, giving birth, dying heads, I'm sorry, dying, heads nodding through hundreds of millions of years, it would have gone on in the profoundest night of non-being down to its unknown end. Human consciousness created objective existence and meaning, and man found his indispensable place in the great process of being. Now there's, you know, we can take exception to this and, you know, look at all of existence itself as filled with consciousness. But I think that basically what he's pointing to is that there's something really special about uh, us uh, and that we shouldn't lose sight of that in the face of all the atrocious things that we're capable of doing. That this simple fact that we are aware that we're aware is a miracle. And from that seed, so much good can come. And I think that CIIS and East-West psychology, uh, especially, uh, if I can... <laughs> you know, uh, say that because it's uh, my heart home, uh, is a place where I think that people come from all over the world now to um, not just to learn that, because certainly we come to schools to learn, but really to uh, uh, learn to express what is alive for them in seed form already. Some people come fully baked. They come as professionals with extraordinary careers. And they, they just come to kind of expand uh, what they already are doing in the world. Um, but I want to honor that. I want to honor every one of the students who spoke, the, the, the miracle that we witness unfolding uh, in symposiums, symposia like this, in classrooms every day in our school, uh, this extraordinary commitment that people have to uh, reimagining the world and uh, moving into uh, uh, a future together uh, where uh, magic and um, spirit and uh, heart, soul, body are all integral parts of an integral whole that can all find expression. So anyway, uh, sorry, I probably spoke over long, but uh, I wanted to share that. Please, any questions, comments, concerns, uh, for our panelists. Jean-Michel. Yeah, okay, I have a few questions for the panelists. Uh, first page, I'm, I was interested in knowing if you know the work of uh, Alejandro 
Jodorowsky, the Psycho Tarot, because um, it seems very uh, close to your research. Oh, thank you, Jean Michel. That sounds like an exciting. Um, no, I don't, and and I would love to. Still being at the beginning of this research. Uh, thank yeah, you. he's a he was a he a filmmaker and cineast, and and he extensively oh. worked on the tarot in, in the same lines as yours. So, yeah. Oh wow! Oh, how fun! Would you mind dropping his name in the chat? I'll definitely look into that. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Came into this, and um. Okay. So uh, for Alex, I had the question. It was brilliant, by the way. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know about the law of manifestation, and I, I, I was thinking about uh, what is the desire at the core of, of a magician, and remembering this, uh, the quoting Alistair Crowley, who said, you know, that do uh, do what you will, but then what is this this will? Is it uh, is it a will based on our ego, or is it a, a, a more profound dimension of will? Uh, to create something different that is not conditioned. Um, so that that's what I wanted to ask you. Yeah, I mean, I that's a great question. I think that is that's kind of the question with magic. Um, and you know, for me, I mean, per personally, I, I I know from my own just in my own practice. I mean, um, I I don't pursue magic in a very directed way because I find that that the the more I do the more clinging it produces in me and the more I end up eliciting some shadow right and and this is also an archetype in the magician there's, there's a very Promethean thing of like you want to steal that fire you're going to be chained to the rock right and so um so uh you, you know for me it it's about it's more about recognizing the 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 truly magical nature of existence and then uh, opening myself to that higher will right which is allowing myself to be guided and um and allowing you know basically i i like to think in terms of you know the mother and sri aurobindo talk, talking about aspiration and desireless desire and and that sort of thing rather than this kind of willful uh, thing that can come in with magic because it can be really destructive and um, yeah so, so so that's my my kind of thing with it but um, you know that said that, that there is something about engaging in a magical practice um, that it, it it draws things out of you so that you know yourself in the process and in, in a way that can be very um, can be disturbing um but 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 also like healing and, and awakening um and, and it makes me think of that that uh line from the gospel of thomas you know that um uh if you uh if you draw out that which is within you it will save you but if you do not draw out that which is within you it will destroy you and you know that so, so the engaging with magic is a kind of a high stakes kind of um <laughs> like way of living in reality um but but i i just i just make a practice of seeing the world as magical and almost living in a divinatory sort of a way just just a way of looking at the world that goes okay well, what was that like what was that and just kind of not trying to analyze but to to let it keep opening me so yeah thanks for the question fantastic thank you Thank I don't you. know if, if I, I can ask my question to Jonathan or if I should leave space for someone else. No, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much. It was so brilliant. And as a musician, I've been asking those questions also for myself. Um, regarding, you know, philosophy and, and music, then what I wanted to ask you is that, I mean, mathematics somehow has been the the I mean uh, music has been a sub, is a, also a subjective experience of of mathematics. Uh, in this sense, it has been uh, lived like that up to now. So then, if if we are if we are going beyond uh, beyond philosophy as as music as uh, musicians, uh, does that mean that we we are going beyond mathematics, or 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 uh, changing our relation to time then? Uh, which which brings the the 
the, the I mean, the question underlying this, I guess, is the are the archetypes determining our our uh, creativity completely, or or do we have to to go beyond the archetypal word to really find a new space in creativity? I don't know if that all that makes sense, but that's what aroused aroused me. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, thanks, John Michel. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's that kind of slide that I I shared uh, talking about axiomatic or problematic formalization i mean archetypes is a type of formalization and i think that it's 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 kind of a fine nuance to what laurel is trying to do because i mean in in one sense if we accept archetypal realm on authority and as an absolute and that's posited for us and we search for solutions within that or we're told this is your problem now, now find a solution. And then I will tell you if your solution is right or wrong. This is, and I think that it's kind of like the habits that have kind of codified in our times. That's kind of what, you know, that's, I feel I resonate with as that is what I have somewhat inherited. Now we all know inside that that's, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And so it's not as black and white as that. It's more like, how can we, how can we just make very sure that we are not, um, this isn't an absolute ceiling. This is just, uh, these are just like what he would call fictions. And that's, you know, it's, it's sort of like it's material to be used, to be, to be used in whatever way it comes, comes through. So I think that's where, I mean, definitely and anything in our lives, any, any kind of discipline we're involved in. I think that's, I, I tried to share these diagrams because it did help me in the sense of like, what is it in my life that is, is really, I haven't questioned from a certain place or it's in me and it's like kind of somehow in in me in the way I think the way I am the way I kind of synthesize reality and I, and I go forward in, in in my life that's that's I'm a, I'm assuming that as just being that's just the way you know like I had a lot a much longer presentation uh, organized um, but it brought in Deleuze's idea of the dogmatic image of thought and going very deeply into how that comes up as good sense and common sense, which I think we can all, again, it's an experience that we can relate to and say, well, it's, this is just common sense. So I'll start from here and go forward. And it's like, no, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the opposite. That's the, we're accepting some kind of a, a formalism, which will, which is really not allowing us to kind of, to find our own problematic, I guess that's, that's really was the the, the, the point. So archetypes can serve us and they can also imprison us it's it's the pharmacon of of image it's the pharmacon of 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 concept and and thinking in a way so i think i think that's where it's like if we think about what we want to do with materials then that's again it's like is that is that circularity happening where we're kind of imprisoning ourselves in the self reflective act of 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 that turning back rather than thinking through them becoming the archetype becoming the the sound becoming the be, just becoming the world in a very unidirectional way but, so do you feel that through that you create another sense of community through sound like you belong to you belong to a, a trans individual sonic groups that are new <laughs> Or I don't know. Yeah, well, we got to build these, don't we? I mean, that's in the diagram I had. That was I didn't have a chance to. This was one thing I uh, didn't bring out. But in the in the one of the triangles, which which uh, had something called the aleatory point, and that's really the idea that we're experimentally becoming together in a way that is unforeseeable, you know. And that's where um, it's it is quite radical in that sense like when we think politically uh, from that perspective it's 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 completely different from what we understand as democracy if we think ethically it's completely different from a moral the moralities that we've inherited from kind of uh from orthodox religions for instance and when we think aesthetically it's 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 different from that place of like this is what good music is according to common sense according to the musicologists so i think I think that it is a place that we have to hold that openness to the unknown and to the the new. We use the materials, we go deep into two traditions, but it's a, it's it's like a pluralist space um, that's based on that kind of that imminence, that metaphysics I was trying to bring out. Fabulous, thank you. Thanks, Jonathan.
And thanks, Sean Michelle. Alexander? Uh, thank you. I have a question to Alex. First of all, <clears throat> thank you so much for your thoughtful, deep, very interesting presentation. Um, I guess I have practical question. <laughs> um, in the context of um, magic thinking, how we can work or naturalize thinking, magic and thinking that was used by politicians to destroy human nature. And when I talk about this, I mentioned there's a, some research on Hitler and how used the Turk and Gulf and I know that there's a, some research on Putin's politician. He is very, I mean, not his, maybe his circle, very engaged in numerology and astrology and uses this in kind of some political actions. So how we can work with this um, mentality without destroying magic essence itself? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I, I think that, you know, when it comes to magic, like, I think of it as like a, like a technology, right? It's, it's a fairly neutral thing, but in the hands of humans, it's, it's going to be used however we're going to use it, right? And, um, and so, <laughs> you know, that's, that's why it's so important just on an individual basis to, like I said earlier, to that, that enga engaging with it will show you what's in you, right? If you've got, uh, if, if you've got this strong desire to control and manipulate and dominate, um, when you start messing around with, with magical operations, like you, you you're going to find that, that whoa, it's, it's going to pull that out of you. And some people just want to ride that wave and do it. Um, but just because that is a possibility, uh, doesn't mean that it is it, it should be suppressed because of course then anything that we suppress is just going to have its own kind of boiling power to to mess with us anyway. So, um, so I think that that acknowledging the the fact of of magic as, as it as it as it really does play out in the world um, that that even if you don't believe in in these kinds of things. Um, that it's still something that that people do, um, like just acknowledging that is a is a is an invitation to take a deeper look at ourselves, um, and and that also you, you know in in thinking about the, this idea that I have of of mind spells, right? To to recognize the malleability of the mind and and how you, you know essentially, I see magical work as you know a magician is kind of working with their own mind's malleability um, to, to, to make other things happen in the world. But by the same token, our minds, all of us are, are, are malleable to, to all kinds of influences. And um, so, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated thing, but I think it's an invitation to recognize that uh, the, the necessity of, of, discovering aspects of ourselves that are beyond the mind you know that 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 it, that it's like a hardcore absolute necessity to 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 realize that that we're not just that which is structured and um and and fr from that basis to 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 realize that we, we might have more freedom to play this game differently than than we think so thank you Thanks, Alex, and thanks, Alexander. Um, Devishish. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think uh, all the papers today were wonderful. I really enjoyed them. I would have loved to engage with, uh, I think, all of them. But uh, <clears throat> I want to make a few comments and also ask a question. So the comments actually related to the issue that's being discussed right now with Alex, uh, having to do with magic. And I think the first question, which was asked by uh, Jean-Michel uh, about the will, and also uh, with Alexandra's question, 
so the comment uh, had to do with, uh, I think uh, one thing Alex uh, would have been good to maybe also bring out are the two forms of magic, right? Theurgy and thaumaturgy, right? Where theurgy is really about embodying. Um, you, you don't assume that the world is just fair game for you to do whatever you want. Uh, whatever you're doing, um, even that assumption is really backgrounded by the fact that you're opening yourself to forces greater than yourself. So you're embodying without being conscious of what you're embodying. So I think both theurgy and thaumaturgy have to be um, acknowledged in magic. And you need to know what it is that you're embodying because it's not your will. It's some other will that you, that's the world is more fluid than we think it is, but it's also a play of wills. It's, it's, it's an active dynamic play of wills that's precipitating events all the time. Uh, so I wanted to um, foreground that. And related to that, uh, I think all the talks uh, in this symposium have been trying to approach uh, something like a problematic of our times, what Jonathan was calling a problematic. Um, a problematic of our times, uh, firstly, there is a, a one school of thought that shies away from the idea of a universal problematic of our times. The, the postmodern view is to look at small, you know, get away from big pictures. But uh, on the other hand, we've become so interdependent right now, it's very difficult not to think about things that affect others as well. And so the problematic of our times in a way is something that we are faced with again and again, because we are into problems that are universal. Uh, so one way of looking at the problematic of our times, I think Jonathan mentioned one way, which is, the plane of imminence in which radical pluralism and absolute monism are the same. Uh, but that's a philosophical statement uh, of, of something which you know, is magnetizing, attracting us. Uh, another way of thinking about the problematic of our times is this notion of objectification, which is a function of the mind. So all the talks in the symposium, in a way, were addressing and acknowledging the fact that uh, the human mind has become its own alien entity. When we are talking about, you know, can we see everything as nature, including human products? Um, yes, we can. But what has happened is that the mind of the human has objectified reality. In other words, it has made itself the subject and stood outside the entire complex of the forces that are running the world. And philosophy, so from what Jonathan was saying about philosophy um, and non-philosophy is like the kind of mandate or the authority that gives us that uh, ability to, and that right, so to say, to stand out and make sense of the world. And the sense we make uh, it's only when we confront each other's sense that we found, find that the sense is also plural. Uh, we don't have one sense to the world. So this problematic becomes one of, um, can the mind operate differently? You see, can the mind find a place where not that it is subordinated to something else, it, it all this while, it's the dominance of the mind, but tomorrow it's going to be the dominance of the heart. This is an old problem. You know, the problematic was framed in this way in the 20th century. But uh, in the 21st century, we recognize that that way of framing the problematic is also infected with the dominance of the mind. Because in a way, what is happening is that we are making these trenchant divides and we are playing, you know, merry-go-round uh, around the various counters that we've set up. So it, this is the, the problematic of the, of the integral. The integral is not that which is this or that. It is also not just putting them all side by side and saying, I accept them all. 
it is finding a plane in which the whole or the one and the many can be the same. Now, to say that is not, it's, it's not, it's not a kind of a trivial thing. And this is what brings me to the final, uh, I mean, comment and also the question related to it. Um, it, it is also related, I mean, it's Jean-Michel's question to Jonathan about the archetypes. And when we are trying to subvert the authority of the mind and it's standing out and becoming the subject of the world, the question that we have to ask is to what can it lend itself? And whatever it lends itself to, is it going to be another determinism? This is what Jean-Michel's question was with regard to, uh, are the archetypes determining? Are we going to fall into contact with something else that is determining? And what Jonathan was saying is essentially, it depends on what we understand by the archetypes. If we become the archetypes, it's not that there is some kind of a understanding that we are embodying of the archetypes, but the freedom of the archetypes who are really in Deleuze's terms, abstract machines. In other words, on the one hand, they are open to radical infinity and they channel a certain creativity into a bound infinity, an infinity that they bind. So that's one way of understanding it. But the question that I had that's related to this and for Jonathan is uh, that of uh, the all and the whole. Okay, this is a distinction that Bergson makes. It's a distinction that Deleuze carries from Bergson. The all is all that has happened. It's the patterns that repeat again and again. It's what we can understand as a sense of everything that exists all at once. But the whole is more than the all. And this is what I wanted to ask you about how you see that distinction in terms of uh, finding a plane of eminence of finding uh, a solution to the problematic of our times, not as an abstraction, but as a power of action in the here and now. Yeah, beautiful question and, and comments, Devashish. Um, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's a beautiful question in the sense of like to bring Laurel back into it. I've asked this to his work because sometimes it feels like his work is axiomatic because as I read his method, I'm perceiving it as some kind of a pre-given method. It's it's he's giving us the axiom, the a priori rules in which we can undergo this, right? And it's I mean that that in that sense, I guess it would be a hegemony of the of of the all. Um and I think that that's where there's a lot of critique of his work because he's very careful with language, I believe, but it also can feel very, very dry. And it's like, well, wait, wait a second. He's just saying that he wants a problematic, uh, imminent, a radically imminent problematic in which we act from, but he's giving us an axiom to, to work by. And I think that part of the, the, the method that he's, he's giving us is, also thinking about what he calls a radical democracy. So this is where the trans individual, which again is a very big concept. And the quote that I read from, from your work, I thought was, was encapsulated in, a, in very concisely, but I think that that's, it's, it's, that's where we have to try to put ourselves into some kind of an openness with, with, with um, the, the whole, the open whole, the, the radically infinite, as that kind of aleatory attractor, which is affective, it's not something that is going to be preconceived that our mind can project forward. It's more like we are, we are in affective relationships with provisional axioms, and that's where, the, you know, even even my diagram. If you took my diagram literally, it's an axiom that is. I'm saying, well, this is what I'm doing before I act, 
but I'm trying to express that this is this is a field of experimentation and those even those terms ethic, political, um, uh, um, ethical, political and aesthetic are not closed. They are open to that other side, and those terms need to be open to the, the radical infinite that that they can they can kind of evoke in us. Is that is that helpful along the lines? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I agree, Jonathan. But one thing that I'd like to uh, also bring to the front is that uh, it's not easy because uh, I think when we are talking about the all and when we're talking about the archetypes and the patterns of the past, we are talking really about a universal karma that's really propagating through time in, that has taken a certain form or certain forms, not just one form, many forms. Uh, and that these are propagating through time. So when we, I think the term Gnostic was used, uh, you know, Gnosis, the Gnostic, uh, when we're talking about Gnostic and we, we are also talking about East and West, uh, one way of understanding East and West, I mean, one way of saying there's no East and West, but there is a way of understanding East and West in terms of the predominating uh, ideas that have um, influenced them through history. And uh, one of the kind of prime concerns of Eastern thinking, say Indian or Chinese uh, thinking has been Gnostic or the Gnosis as understood as a realm outside of ideas. See, that which is pure perception, that which exists, just exists. Okay, can we come to the point of pure existence? And the dominant notion of uh, the West, on the other hand, is to find the idea or ideas, uh, particularly the idea, which has been called the logos, right? The, the, the seeking for the logos. Um, and I, I think you can't drop either of them. You see, that's where the East-West thing comes in. If you recognize the fact that we dwell in a world of ideas, the ideas are structuring things, but they're not absolutely structuring things. They exist and they're working out through us. Uh, so when we are talking about finding the aleatory point of finding a place of creativity outside the archetypes, we have to recognize that it's way more difficult than what human capacity presently gives us. It isn't just tapping into a certain degree of creativity. It's finding a universal creativity, a power, a power of magic, a power of theurgy, which is really in, in, in the terms of say, people like Sri Aurobindo or in Jungian terms, greater than that of the collective unconscious greater than that of the overmind, for example. And I think we need to recognize that because it, it isn't easy. We can't stop short. And at the same time, we can't just say that we are going to do it just by saying it. So I, I think that's a problematic of our time and the, and the depth and difficulty of the problematic of our time. Yes, absolutely. And and Debushi, I just what, what's coming up for me is, is uh that quote I use as well of your work, which is on thought within the thought. And it, it's interesting because again, let's say we open to some kind of a, a aleatory point, some kind of a, a future. We, we, we experience some kind of newness as an unthought. And then that habit of turning it into a thought structure and then immediately owning, possessing and so forth. Um, it's sort of like that future orientedness is, is a whole other temporal um, type of subjectivity, which we're leaning into that future, constantly acknowledging that the thought or whatever does come from the unthought is fine, but it's kind of like that just being so fluid with it and just just saying, great, let's keep on going. Let's let's keep on, just keep on creating. Let's keep on moving, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, to have a contact uh, with the unthought uh, within the thought is it brings two kinds of problems. One is exactly what you said, you know, that, that is that we can turn it into that which belongs to the realm of thought. Uh, the other problem is that we can leave it as it is. In other words, it becomes a transcendental. So it is only when that can actually be made into 
or seen as the unthought that has become the realm of thoughts. See, that it is possible for a transformed existence to show itself. So I, I think that, that making that link, that is Vigyana. That is really when we are talking about talking, when uh, I think uh, Peter Hoover's um, presentation yesterday, where he was talking about the body of wisdom or the body of knowledge, uh, that is the true gnosis where you perceive now in terms of uh, that unthought within the thought having become the world of ideas, essentially. Thanks, Devashish. And I just, just will say, I, I shared the link to the article that I cited uh, because uh, somebody was asking, but I just think it's very relevant. It's a short piece that you wrote. I mean, four paragraphs, but as potent as, as it gets. So I just wanted everybody to have access to that. If they're interested. And we are we are coming close to a time. Alex, do you have a short comment? Yeah, I mean, I don't really have time to to go deeply into it, but just to you, you know, to Debashish's point that it's um, you know, it's it, it's very hard to actually actually make the transformation that we're kind of pointing our, our finger at, right? And um, in terms of thinking, I've been thinking about this as relates to archetypes because I practice archetypal astrology and. Um, you, you know, just a, as an astrologer, um, I, I see the way that, you know, 99.9999999% of the time with astrology, there's this kind of trying to lock down on a, on a rigid concept and define reality, define ourselves, define events in these terms. It's like, oh, look, I figured it out. I figured it out. That's why it's happening. Oh, thank God. You know, um, and, and I've really trained myself to, to not do that and, and to see the, the archetypes instead as, instead of as being these, these kind of categories that define things to be, to being like portals that open us up to be able to perceive what we could not otherwise perceive. And it's a very delicate uh, balance with that, but, but it's possible. And I, and I think that, that the whole thing, you, you know, whenever we start to engage with these kinds of practices that, that open us to these dimensions, the mind will almost want to come in like, like as an allergic reaction to just go like, you know, okay, I got, I got something now and just grab on and, and define. But like the, the, the task is, is rather to, to continue to open out and let it, let it bring us to, you know, like Sri Aurobindo's idea of the intuitive mentality that it, that it's, that the mind becomes, that our thinking becomes a, a servant of this opening. And um, yeah, so just wanted to offer that. Thank you. There was, Alex, I just want to add, there was a, a moment in a conversation that was recorded privately between Jung and one of his um, colleagues, clients. I, I don't know uh, what relationship she had to him, but she wrote a book where she had taken notes for a number of years when she met with him. And he was talking about the age of Aquarius. And he said, you know, the archetypes are in constant flux. They evolve the way that we that the, everything else in the universe evolves. They're not fixed. The idea that they're fixed is something that's come up in popular culture. It's, it's like Carolyn misses 72 archetypes. That, that is, that's kind of just a pop way of looking at it. And so she asked him about the age of Capricorn. And he said that he had a glimpse of it, intuitive glimpse of it, but that he couldn't encapsulate it because it was so foreign to our way of thinking. So we have to also understand that we are in embedded in, you know, we're born into a world that has that has many of these things in place, even though they're in process, because we live, we have such a small time frame that we're here to experience. So God evolves, the universe evolves, ideas evolve, the archetypes evolve. And the aleatory point, if I understand it correctly, and I haven't read the same philosophy, Jonathan, that you and Debashish have been reading, it's ever receding. In, in, in Jung's way of looking at it, my understanding of this idea from what I've read of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, that there's no more prolia, it's not going to close any longer, that there's this long duration that takes place. That this, to me, speaks to something that's very similar, that as we move forward from here that this point is always going to be receding we're always going to be reaching for it or in a theurgic way attempting to draw it towards us um 
so in in some ways we're just we we are a moment that's woven into a vast <clears throat> evolutionary movement of the universe and as in magic is about reading that uh the the idea of imposing our own will is something the deeper i the deeper i get into the traditions it's <clears throat> it's obviously there excuse me <clears throat> it's obviously there it's obviously really important to take into account because uh, these any kind of siddhi or ability that you develop can be misused but the deeper teachings are always about aligning oneself with what is which is essentially the will of the divine if you want to call it that or god if you want to call it that and it's more about surrender the practice is more about surrender than about the imposition of the individual's egoic will and you find that in Jung. you find that in crowley even in alistair crowley um, interesting so uh steph i just wanted to comment briefly about about, about that that some, at least i mean even that uh, that what you just said about the archetypes are always changing it's an assumption because many traditions don't believe that uh for example the entire indian tradition believes that the archetypes of the gods don't change but man makes gods change so whatever evolution is taking place uh, evolution happens on earth according to some traditions at least and the archetypes that the change in the archetypes are really being uh, brought forth by the creativity of the human according to these traditions so we are in a sense in relation with these things and in in that sense the human is greater than the gods because the human is the you know penultimate or actually the ultimate power of creativity mm -hmm. if we have if we have contact with that or if we can get there before that we aren't we are determined and we are determined by fixities that we can only partially change uh, according to these traditions at least right yeah i i, I think that makes perfect sense to me um, and i know from my, my reading of the mother and Sri Aurobindo, there's this idea that everything that happens kind of beneath the realm of the stars, the astrological reality, all this the kind of hermetic knowledge that we, has been passed down to us, that there is in their yoga, the movement beyond that. And what happens when you move beyond that, when, when you're no longer kind of fixed or determined by harmony, you know, by the, by the, um, uh, the, the dicta of what the stars say but I, and i you know but i i have to admit from my own perspective that i have not i have not moved beyond it in in intuitively i think that i get glimpses of it but i'm still working at kind of untying the knots at of of my own birth and this moment in time and i i like this idea of i think what you're saying is really accurate that the that in in certain traditions the gods don't change there's a way in which all of all of the gods if i understand indian philosophy correctly that all of the gods ultimately um are a part of the a, a larger whole that can be called um you know shiva or it can be called brahma um and and uh, Jean-Michel was talking about, we were talking about the Om yesterday, uh, this idea that there is, if everything is moving back towards this point, there is this, a sound or a, vib a vibratory energy or some awareness of something moving towards unity that we experience in the, in the Om and that then disseminates or breaks down into the individual components. And I, I think that we can have that intuition, especially when we're doing these practices. And I think that I think that a lot of magic actually points towards that. At least Agrippa's magic is pointing towards that. But much of magical practice in the world is really about getting what one wants. Um, you know, Neville Goddard, this idea that you know the power of positive thought to achieve our ends, and it gets it gets kind of really muddy because it gets mixed up with the ego and desire. And how to how to discriminate those is is part of the practice. Um, yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, I, I completely agree, Steph, and that's that's the reason why it's so difficult. 
I mean, unraveling this is um, not something that uh, we can achieve with our power. We can talk about it, but uh, it's really, a, a, like Nietzsche says, it's, it's a will to power, uh, power over ourselves. And uh, this power uh, doesn't come easy. It's, it's really uh, through uh, uh, surrender, through diligent relationship with the gods and with the power that is beyond the gods that uh, we can gradually move towards that. Yeah, and I, I'm, I can barely articulate it myself, but when I do find that I articulate some aspect of it that in a way that I think is clear, then I'm in danger of actually believing what it was, what it is that I just said. So it is, it's really tricky to remain in that kind of open, anticipatory surrender. Um, it's a, it's really difficult. But I think that, I, and I'll just put in a plug for everybody who's here. <laughs> That's one of the things that is comes up in the classes, especially in Devashish's classes and in conversations with Devashish. This is a really good place to explore that edge. I think. Our, our program. Well, let's. Uh, oh, Jonathan can. Let's yeah. explore the edge of the ending, because we're <laughs> over time, and I want to respect everybody's ending. I appreciate everybody uh, sticking around. I mean, this has been an amazing conversation, amazing uh, four uh, panels and uh, and two sessions, and people pushing their maybe normal schedules, and due to the multiple time time zones, I really appreciate everybody. Um, um, being flexible and, and inspired to do this work. And uh, I'd just like to thank everybody, uh, Stefan, for your for your facilitation today, moderating, and Debashish um, for moderating, as well as being our opening and closing, um, giving, uh, being here for the opening and closing. Um, anything else that should be said before we, we end for today? Uh, so I will make these available on the, the East West Psychology YouTube channel um, within a week, probably. And you can share share them with people that maybe couldn't come. Um, but I look forward to, to building building this energy. It's, a, you know, it's annual and every year, I think we're building on last year and we're just keep keeping intensifying these questions and uh, and opening up these problematics. Well, thanks everybody.